we want to understand what biblical counseling really is. It's different from the normal types of counseling you'll find out in the world and in many cases what you find in the church. So we need to explain it very carefully. Biblical counseling is the process by which one sinner helps another sinner to grow in his walk with Christ through the practical application of God's Word to specific areas of failure while strengthening areas of success. In the 70s, along comes Jay Adams. As he was reading books, um, realized there just wasn't a whole lot after the Puritans that dealt with this, and sort of, he wrote a seminal book called Competent to Counsel, and that really started shaking things up. And starting there in the late 60s, early 70s, a movement, a biblical counseling movement began. And I didn't uh, start out intending to do it, but uh, when I had a class that was given to me at Westminster Seminary and that nobody else wanted to take, a class in biblical counseling, I had no background, no uh, experience, and could find no text that would enable me to teach this course. So it set me to work on digging into the scriptures to find out what God had to say, because that was the important thing, and that was the beginning of what I was involved in. Bill had a counseling appointment, and he had asked me and another pastor in the class to sit in on this counseling appointment. I said, sure. And, um, and this elderly couple came in, very, very well-dressed. The man had a three-piece suit on. He had long sleeve white shirt with cufflinks and a nice tie, and she had a beautiful dress on. And, and, but you could tell as soon as they walked in, they did not look anybody in the eye. They looked at the floor. Something had had happened and it appeared to be devastating. And they sit down, sat down and Bill had prayer with them. And he said, why have you come to counseling? And they kind of hemmed and hawed a little bit about it. He was arrested for this. It drug his company through the mud. It drug his church through the mud. It drug his family name through the mud. They went from the pinnacle of respect in their community right down to being rejected and almost hated by everyone overnight. So I remember sitting there thinking to myself, okay, John, you've just had four years of psych classes in college. You've had four years of seminary. You should be able to help these people. And I didn't have a clue what I'd do. I didn't have a clue. And so I was very dedicated from that particular point on to make sure that I knew how to not just dispense the Bible, but minister the Bible to people that were hurting, that needed help, that needed change. Before we go much further into this, we gotta take a brief pause and define the heart. Because in today's culture, the heart generally means one of two things. It either means feelings or intuition. So you either get, you know, they broke my heart, love you with all my heart, or you get, follow your heart. Biblically, the heart is a much broader category. It covers those things. But um, the Bible warns, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. The Bible's view of the heart is that it is the innermost part of our spiritual being. It's a well, it's, it's, it's a wellspring where all of the issues of life and all of our fears and all of our loves and all of our desires and all of our thoughts and all of our feelings and our will comes out. It's really an umbrella category that deals with all those things. So does it deal with emotions? Sure it does. But it deals with so much more. But let's take a look at Luke 6, 44 to 45. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Now get that principle. What Jesus is saying is before a word ever comes off your tongue, before a word or an action ever 
takes place in space and time, its source, its root, if you will, is the heart. It starts in the heart, and then it ends up in my tongue, and then it ends up as the work of my hands, and then it ends up in time and space with my body moving, speaking. So I want you to picture a tree, and its root structure, there's the heart. There is this source, there is this wellspring, where everything comes up out of. And so out of the heart, then, source is everything, and all that fruit on that tree, and by fruit, I want you to think of the good things we say and the bad things we say, the good things we do, the bad things we do, the actions. The fruit of those actions, the root is the heart. And so if you're just dealing with the, with the actions, you're really missing the foundational point. And, and in the heart, in every one of our hearts, there is a throne. Because we're all made to be worshipers. Worship is just the old English word worthship, to ascribe value. We all live as though something is worth living for. We all live as if something is valuable. We all worship something. And so the question is, what is sitting on the throne of our hearts? Is it ourselves? Is it the fear of other people? Is it desire? Is it lust? Is it pleasure? Is it the living God? And if we just deal with counsel that just deals at the top of the tree... We're really missing the root. Jesus in Matthew 12, 13 says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit and sin comes from within, not without. And we can go to oodles of passages to back this up, but let's just look at one, Mark 7, 20 to 23. Jesus speaking. He said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within... Out of the heart of man, now get that, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. They defile a person. The good news is, God offers to give us the heart cure. The problem is my heart there is a gospel that deals with my heart, and that's good news. That's very good news. See, if the problem is my genetics, if the problem is my parents, if the problem is you, well, the gospel's not going to be able to fix that. The problem is my heart. Well, when we've got the cure. We've got the promises of God. We've got the grace. We've got a Savior. We've got a word. We've got a spirit. We have a church all bent at dealing with the heart. Several years ago, Jay Adams went to the International Association of Psychiatrists and Psychologists in Berlin, Germany, their annual meeting. He was invited to come. They wanted to hear, what is this new thing, biblical counseling? And so he was able to address an audience of about a thousand of them. And he got up and he said to them, he said, uh, there's one thing that all counseling has in common. We all are looking for people to change. But he said, the difference between you and me is that you cannot agree what you want people to change into. We're talking about discerning desires and thinking and behavior that God wants to change. That's addressing the whole person. And it uses the Word of God by the Holy Spirit to change those desires, thinking, and behavior. The Word of God is the chief diagnostic tool. The Word of God is also the remedy, the change agent used by the Holy Spirit in the life of people where they really change internally, inside out. It revolutionizes your own life first, and that's what it did to me. You see, it had to impact me first. I had to see my own pride. I had to see my own arrogance. It's something that I think we all struggle with, and it's nothing that we always get conquered completely, but we continue to struggle with this as long as we are sinful human beings. But it, it, it's biblical counseling and learning how to use the Bible in very practical ways and the theology of the Bible in very practical ways that ends up changing us first before it really ends up changing other people. You can't ultimately change anybody. Only God can. My name is Bob Smith, 
I'm one of the counselors at Faith Biblical Counseling Ministry. Two books. Okay, I'm in Romans. Chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. Now read 28 and I'm going to stop you a minute. You read this time, Karen. Um, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Okay. Some things work for good. Yeah. We know that in all things. Some no, all some things. What's your thing? Well, God causes all all things to work. No, you're reading it wrong. It says some things. <laughs> oh no! Okay, now I'm catching it. <laughs> okay. I did that on purpose. <laughs> all things includes all things. Okay. Now, who said that? Well, God. God. You believe that? Mm -hmm. All things, what does he say about all things? Works for the good of those who love him. No, that's everybody else but you. So how, how do we, so when it says those who love God, I, I guess I'm, I am saying, would that be me? me? Would that be us? Why, why wouldn't it be? Aren't you people who have accepted Christ as Savior? Now, we need to find out what that good is. So read 29, Karen. Um, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Now, look at that verse and see what God is doing in the good in 28. What do you see in 29 that would be good for you and me? To be conformed. To, to the likeness of his son. Okay. Mm -hmm. Become more like Christ. Would that be good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Would that be beneficial? Mm -hmm. So the all things of verse 28 has the purpose of helping you become more like Christ. In other words, wow. everything that happens, God's goal is for that to help a person become more like Christ. But they may not necessarily That's right. become more like even Christ. That's right. Even though God's goal is there for okay. them to become more like Christ. Okay. Okay. You, am I? Thanks. You helped yeah, me clarify. I got it now. So, like with our kids, we want them to do right things, but they may not. They may not. That doesn't mean you don't have your goal in doing right things. Okay. 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 All right. Now, God's goal is for you to become more like Christ, and that's good. Mm -hmm. With me, mm -hmm. all things help you become more like Christ. All things have as a goal something beneficial for you. Okay. Now, hang on to your chairs. Mm -hmm. What does all include? But the fact is, God has allowed you to have this tough experience for you to become more like Christ. I guess I just never thought of it that way. All right, I understand. And I'm not, I, I, I appreciate where you are, and I'm, I'm not at all critical of where you are. I, I, your struggles are, are understood and expected. Now, what that does is gives purpose to some unpleasant situations, right? Just the connection between God working all things for our good and all that, and I thought, well, I'd never thought about my fibromyalgia having anything to do with living my life to please God. So that's been something I'm trying to figure out. Okay, which brings me to the summary of the last session. Let's, let's hear your summaries. Um, I need to please God, and everything that God brings in my life is for my good to be more like Christ. Okay. And we need to be living by the Bible, 
God is in this somewhere. I just don't know where. Well, if I were to substitute all things, I'd say God can use my fibromyalgia to work for my good, which would be to help me to be more like Christ. Okay, now, then the next question is, what qualities of Christ does God want you to develop as a specific result of having fibromyalgia? Now, let's give you a guideline. Turn to Galatians. Can we read it? Yes, please. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, that's the fruit of the Spirit, and Jesus manifested all of that. Okay. Now, if you're going to become more like Christ, mm -hmm. you need to work on developing one or more of those. Now, fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia is very uncomfortable to you. You've got a lot of unpleasantness with it. So what quality of Christ can God be wanting you to develop of that list because of fibromyalgia, as a direct result of fibromyalgia? Um, I think a couple that I see would be patience. All right, now how patience? How would, how would he want you to develop patience? How does that produce patience? How can you develop patience as a result of it? Well, I think that I'm very impatient. Because of? Because of the fibro. Okay, and how does that show? Um, I get irritable. Uh, well, the two that jumped out at me from that passage in Galatians was the, um, well, they all do. But self-control was another one that all I right. thought of. How's, how's self-control an issue? Well, I don't think that I um, do a good job of controlling my emotions. So, here is fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. Now, look at it. Fibromyalgia has been allowed by God to help you become more like Christ. What do you think about that? I just never put those two things I understand. together. I understand. I, I, I agree. You have it. Yeah. What do you think about the concept? It's... It's... Um, it's scary, but it's not. All right, how's it scary? To think that God would allow that is kind of scary. Okay, what's scary about it? Because sometimes I guess I think if God is a good God, He wouldn't allow that. So He wouldn't allow labor pains, He'd just give you a baby? I don't know. Well, now, what do you think? What are, you, what are we saying? What, God is a bad God because he allows labor pains to get a baby. No. But isn't that what the same thing here? I guess so. No. You guess so. <laughs> You're struggling with what I can see. I am. I understand. Because it's a new concept. Mm -hmm. See, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're trying to see this from a biblical perspective, and it is a brand new focus. We live in a world that doesn't think this way. Our world, what we're talking about is totally foreign to the non-believer. And this is a brand new concept. It's not a concept that's familiar to many believers, but yet it's right there in the scripture. But God still intends to use fibromyalgia to help you become more like Christ for your benefit. Now, where it's scary is thinking, well, let me see if I can guess. Maybe I won't have relief of pain because it's for my benefit not to have relief of pain. But why would God let you do that? Not have the relief? Yeah, why would God allow that? To be more like Christ? Which is more important? Relief or become more like Christ? Become more like Christ. Now, that's a new concept. Mm -hmm. We have to accept that on faith. Mm -hmm. See, I don't, here's the point. This one I feel. 
the, the lack of relief I fail, I feel. Mm -hmm. Becoming more like Christ, I don't feel. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to say this. Relief is not wrong. Okay. Pursuing relief is not wrong. That's part of stewardship. That's not bad. Okay. But that's not the primary focus. The primary focus is to become more like Christ so that if there is no relief, you're not devastated mm -hmm. because it has a purpose. So that your focus with fibromyalgia is not, it makes me irritable. No, the focus on fibromyalgia is, yeah, it does make me irritable, but I need to learn to be patient. It makes me impatient. That's true, but I need to learn to be patient. I need to learn to even have joy when I tend to be very sad. I need to put on the character Christ, and that will help me to minister to some people who also are in struggles with symptoms that won't relieve. Okay. What would they say, what would they do if when they come to talk to you and you said, you know, I thank God for fibromyalgia. What would they say? Are you insane? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But could you say that? I don't know if I could right now. All right, I understand. But if you put this together mm -hmm. and you agree to us, see, you could I say I want it. to say that. Well, all right. What keeps you from saying it? I don't know. You don't feel like it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't want it. But do you have to feel like it to, to give thanks? You read that, giving thanks for all things and yeah, all yeah, things. Yeah. Do you have to feel that to do it? I guess not. It says give thanks. It doesn't say feel thankful. True. See, see what happens. Here's where we get where we get freedom as believers. We are free from living by our feelings because we live by the word of God. Now, our feelings are not diminished. We're not trying to say they're no good. You know, we, we're not non-feeling people. We're not trying to say ignore the feelings. That's mm -hmm. that won't work either. Mm -hmm. But what we say is, okay, I have these feelings. But instead of my feelings control me, God's word controls me. I started with the story of that man who came into counseling. And let me end there. I saw God radically change that couple. And they actually, at the end of that counseling, was able to go back to their home church and go back. He was able to go back to his company. He was able to go back to his family and back into his community and actually use this as an occasion to humbly admit his wrong and his sin and to talk about how Jesus Christ, through his grace, had radically changed his desires. He used that as an occasion to point to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and His transforming power.